Hello and welcome back everybody to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John and this is episode 233. Each and every week I sit down here and answer your questions. I do my best to answer each and every one. Um, if you have a question, uh, send them here to the podcast and that address is podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. Um, we got a good selection today. Uh, I like a couple of them a lot. And one of them is something that seems to come up a lot, and it's our first one. So let's get started. It's a question from Ken. And Ken is going to ask about a workout called the Armor Building Complex, or the ABC, which has become kind of famous. A lot of people are doing it now. Uh, kind of like the 10,000 Swing Challenge, the Goblet Squat, the Suitcase Carry. Uh, the ABC and the Humane Burpee. Uh, uh, the ABC has been now invented by other people, but I came up with it years ago as a finisher for our kettlebell certs. Uh, we needed something, uh, by the time the certs are over, people's, especially people who come in from a push up bench press background, all the vertical pressing we do, they're, they're pretty fried when we come to the last day and the last hours. So it's, with kettlebells, it's two cleans, one press three front squats, and that's double kettlebells. Um, generally, I recommend, you know, try it out. You can try it out with the 14s, the 16s, but generally for most people, I would say, if you're doing it with the 20s, the 24s, you're doing just fine. I know a lot of people say, well, I do it with the 32s. Um, and I certainly can, but I mean, the thing is, it's also, it's one of those workouts where you're trying to not just, you know, <laughs> ground yourself into the ground, you know, but you're also trying to get something. So for a lot of people, they, they might overbell on this. Uh, so let's get started. Good question, Ken. Uh, this one's about the ABC and recovery time. I was listening to your programming advice for the ABC, where you recommend doing it on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, that's just part of it, Ken. For, for the rest of you, what I recommend if you're going to do it, Monday and Friday of week one, you, you do the ABC. Maybe up like, here's a simple thing to do. Okay, uh, do it for 30 minutes. Uh, start every minute on the minute. Uh, you'll, it'll give you anywhere from 15, uh, well, uh, uh, anywhere from 45 to 40 seconds of rest. Some of you might be a little slower, but that's about right. And, and that's sustainable for the whole time. The next week, just do it on the Wednesday. So week one, twice, week two, once week three, twice, week four, once. If I'm really trying to optimize for strength endurance, is there anything stopping me from creating a six to 12 week focused progressive program where I do the ABC three or four times a week or more? Or do you reckon that to get the most out of it, I should really take two to four days to recover each time? Um, it's not so much about the recovery from the ABC. It's the fact that with the ABC, you're doing a lot of front squats. You're doing a reasonable amount. You know, like on that, it's like you do 30. That's 30 presses, 60 cleans, and 90 squats. I just think it takes a few days to recover from 90 squats. Um, there are so many other things you can do, and you mentioned specifically uh, strength and endurance uh, in the weight room. Uh, the humane uh, burpee is a good one. I'll give you the, the classic I'll give you the hardest one, uh, and you can scale down from there. You do 15 swings, 10 gobble squats, 10 push-ups, 15 swings, 9 gobble squats, 9 push-ups, 15, 8, 8, and you go all the way down to 15, 1, 1. It's 150 swings, 55 gobble squats, and 55 push-ups. I mean, if you decided to do that, you know, say you do the ABC on a Monday, do the Humane Burpee on a Wednesday, the ABC on a Friday, and then, you know, fill any other gaps you have on the other days, the Tuesday, Saturday, whatever. That's a pretty good program. That's, that's, I mean, that's a lot of work. And remember, with kettlebell training, it's going to, I mean, I've noticed this myself. When I was doing the Humane Burpee all the time, it got me in really good shape to do the Humane Burpee. But it didn't really necessarily carry over. I mean, obviously, you you know, you're you're in good shape. You, you know, you you look good, you feel good, you move good, but it's not like you're going to do the humane burpee and then, you know, do a triathlon or anything. It would support a triathlon probably, but it's not, it's not going to, uh, you know, be the, whether you're running 
eight hour, you know, Iron Man versus nine hour Iron Man. Those are pretty good times. Uh, do you really need the two to four days to recover? If you're going to try to do this, Ken, and, and I, I don't, I don't think it's a terribly bad idea. Uh, and you're going to go for, like you say, a six to 12 week program. If you're going to be, you know, getting in there three to four times a week, if you're doing the 30 minutes, even 20 minutes, you know, when you look at those front squat numbers, that's the key. So a lot of people are going to say, well, then let's just back off the front squats. And now my thought always is then don't do the workout. Once you start changing the variables, you really start to lose the vision of the whole workout. And uh, that's not, not a negative point or anything, but uh, you know, it's like I have that program called the one lift a day and I get it's not so much anymore, but 15 years ago, uh, what if I did bench presses on the day I front squatted? Then it's like, well, that's not the one lift a day. And, and it's funny to say that thing out loud because it's so obvious to me. But, you know, if you're doing that one workout we had where you did eight sets of five in the front squat followed by jumps, that was one of our uh, templates for the uh, program. We later eased it to seven sets of five, which was still a nightmare. Uh, I mean, if you can even think about training after that, you know, if you did it the way we did it, you, you know, you're a braver man than I, okay? So can you do it? Yeah, I, I kind of wish you to put together like the outline of what you wanted to do. If you are going to do this three or four times a week, you might want to do something like week one, three times a week, week two, two times a week, week three, four times a week, and then repeat that uh, for the 12 weeks. And I think that would work out time-wise. Uh, that way, uh, when you get to week two with just the two workouts, maybe one of those could be the, an extraordinarily longer one. So, and then maybe, I think week two is going to be the key on this, honestly. You want to survive on the weeks where you do the pro, uh, ABC three times and four times. And on the weeks you do just twice, explore longer times on one day, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour. You know, because 60 th times three is 180 front squats, which you know, is a lot of front squats. And the other one, maybe try to load up a bell. If you're using the 24s, jump to the 28, the 32s or something like that and get a sense of how things are. Uh, the next week you do the four, you come back and do the three. And when you come back, uh, you, you might notice that doing the 32s and doing the extra time will support your whole idea here. Um, for those of you who've never tried the program, or don't really follow what I'm trying to say. It's one of those things you kind of have to do it to understand it as in so much of life, right? There, there's so many things in life where the talking is one thing, but the doing is something else. So thank you, Ken. That's a, that's a very good question. Brandon asked a question and what program would you suggest to help me achieve your sleepless in Seattle standards that you created? That could be including the Olympic lifts as well as the big barbell lifts as I have been practicing Olympic lifts with very light weight uh, lately as well. Well, first off, those numbers are from Paul Lysingo. Uh, Paul wrote this book not long ago and I like it. Uh, Building Back from Zero. Paul, thank you. Uh, Paul's also the guy that got me started with the Guardian Academy and I really appreciate that too, Paul. Um, so there's a bunch of lists there. I mean, I include uh, my high school standards in the Sleepless in Seattle. Um, <laughs> I often will sit down with, or I'll, you know, I'll get emails or I'll be on a forum and someone's talking about this or that. And I'll just give my high school boy sports standards where I expect you to be able to clean 205, front squat 205, um, you know, clean and jerk was at 165, uh, and I'll get an email back. I'm not that strong. Well, yeah, uh, you're not as strong as a typical high school varsity, varsity athlete. And on the women's side, you know, the, the numbers are very good. I think, uh, you know, you got the, the, I use 95 for the front squat, the clean. Um, 205 uh, is, you know, one of the numbers. And those are all real reasonable numbers that I had a lot of success with. There's some other numbers on that list because it's a whole, a whole bunch. If you look at that one list from Paul, and those are the ones that have push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry. Brandon, this is what I think most people miss. So I am going to be talking about how to do it, but listen to this first. 
The idea on it was to find your flat tire. So you look at that list and let's say you could overhead squat your body weight for 15, which is pretty impressive, but you can't, uh, um, but you can't do a single pull up. Uh, so you're a, you're a seven, you know, you're a seven and we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You're a seven in the squat standard and you're a one in the pull up standard or two. Well, that's your problem. What the first thing you want to do, Brandon, is you want to kind of test and see where your numbers are. Uh, we, it, we used to come with a, uh, it used to come with, um, a spreadsheet that allowed you to see your flat tire. It was kind of cool. My friend Stoney Beckstead put it together, but you know, it's funny how the internet doesn't support some things like it used to. Um, for whatever reason, the, the internet doesn't support that spreadsheet anymore, which I, I don't even understand what I just said, but I know that doesn't work anymore because the internet doesn't support it. And the idea is like, if you're like me, you know, I'm a seven in the squat, I'm a seven in the push, I'm a seven in the a hinge, and then I'm like a two or three in the pull. So if you see me training and you see me, you know, going for a max deadlift or bench press contest, you know, your job is to kind of walk over, tap me on the shoulder and say, you're still as stupid as ever because I'm still, the the gap between my strength and my weaknesses just keeps extending. I need to pull, 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 pull. And you can even argue at the expense of my strengths. I, I have this standard I use with athletes. So just, so remember when I'm working with athletes, I train your weaknesses, but we compete with your strengths. So if you have a massive hinge uh, from birth and the way you've trained, we're still going to use the hinge to prepare you for competition. But we might use your squat to keep you mobile, flexible, healthy, and strong in place to bring your gap up. So that's what the Sleep is in Seattle idea is, is to give you an idea of where you are and where your gaps are, where your weaknesses are. So first, you've got to go through those numbers, uh, Brandon, and see where you are. Now, if you're all fours, say, if you're all, yeah, if you're all fours or you're all fives, you know, pretty much for most people, I can fold my arms and say, yeah, you're doing fine. If you're all fives all across, yeah, you got this. You're doing great. You know, pat on the back. Good job. Um, and maybe we look into something else. You know, we'll, we'll you know, actively score, uh, you know, you know, you know, with a, with a torch, you know, look, look around for your, uh, uh, your, your, your next issue, your next challenge, your next goal. If you're a seven here and a one here, don't chase anything else until you bring that one up to a two or three or four at least. Uh, so one, find out where your gap is, find out where your weakness is. Two, then try to get yourself in a situation you're threes across the line, I'm at fours across the line, I'm at fives across the line. The best way I know, and it really was designed, uh, well, I'm gonna tell you the workout generator. I mean, I think the workout generator is the best way to do this because the workout generator you know, if I plug in five days a week, I push, I pull, I hinge, I squat, I loaded carry, I do mobility, and I do flexibility all five days a week from the information from the workout generator. What I can also do then is go in and change the exercises. So if my push is getting really far ahead, I might want to pick a push pattern that maybe challenges my balance or something like that. Um, there are some some lower end ones that I have more problems with. Like if you tell me to do incline bench press, and I go, sign me up, I got this. But if you tell me to take a suspension trainer and do that push-up variation, it's kind of like a you, you do the dip, and then at the bottom you put the arm off the, your arm bar off to the side, you bring it back in, and you you push up dip. It's that dippy push upy suspension trainer move. Then I come back down, arm bar off to the left, bring it back, push it up. Even though the load, me, isn't nearly the same as inclines, that stability and stuff really schools me. So that's one of the reasons I like the workout generator, especially if you spin the exercise selection a little bit each and every day. Workout generator would be first. And then the other thing I'd recommend, uh, uh, Brandon, 
is maybe getting a buddy or somebody to help you out, uh, somebody you trust, and maybe test. This actually is not a terrible idea. It reminds me of Nick Raines' Fit Ranks, but uh, it would be a fun thing to test on week one. Uh, we're going to do the, you know, the one standards. You know, basically, can you get into the position? And it's interesting, if you take a picture of it, you take a video of the exercises of you doing it, and then you watch them later with an honest eye, you might say, yeah, I thought I had good flexibility, but that's an ugly squat or that's brutal. Maybe the next week you test week two, maybe the next week you test week three. Once you find yourself at a place where you can't get up to the standard on a week, like week four, oh, okay, I nailed this, I nailed that, I nailed this, and then, boy, there's that gap. Well, there you go. That's where you're going to focus on for a while. I love having standards that are based across performances. So now, obviously, I mean, you know, I'm a, you know, a track and field coach. And, you know, one of the things I love about track and field is you have the, the stopwatch and you have the measuring tape. And it's, and it's really honest. But what's also interesting is that to improve somebody sometime, um, you know, uh, you know, I kind of think you could be an elite discus thrower with just doing, uh, squat snatches. I, th I think he'd be really good, but then all of a sudden you won't, you'd stop improving and we'd say, well, what's wrong? Well, they're missing this, that gap. And once we start doing an exercise that doesn't look very discusy, they start getting better. Suitcase carry, incline bench, and I guess it looks a little bit like it. Um, you know, front squats and, you know, pull-ups, which when I was young, pull-ups are the answer to all questions in track and field. So I think that's what I'd like you to do, Brandon. Test yourself first, okay? If you want to be on the sleepless in uh, Seattle standards, test yourself. Don't just go in and check the boxes, but actually do them. I would suggest week one, week two, week three, week four. Try that. If you can get up to week five, week six, and I tell you one thing, week seven will open your eyes if you do all those in one workout. And then use something like the workout generator that's going to give you a mix of movements, uh, attack your gaps, weak points, uh, still play with your strong points, you, and then you can kind of mess around with exercise variations to get yourself up. I think if you're at four, five, or six, you're going to be a very happy person um, for a long time. Are those numbers perfect? No. Are standards ever perfect? No. They're best guess with the information we have. But the reason we have standards is this. It's so I can sit down with an American football player and say, I look at your numbers and I say, okay, your problem isn't the weight room anymore. Your problem is you can't catch a pass. You can't make a tackle. Uh, you, your teammates can't trust you or whatever. It's, the answer is no longer in the weight room. It's out there. When I work with track and field athletes, you know, if you're a male and you bench, I mean, without really training very hard, if you bench 400, squat 450, snatch 250, and clean 300, and you can do that, you know, practically any day of the week, your problem's not in the weight room if you're not throwing as far as you want. Your problem's out there. It's, it's your arousal control. It's your... You're, you're managing your heart rate, which is really an interesting thing. You got technical issues. You've got tactical or strategic issues. It's something else. Standards teach this. The problem is not the weight room. The problem is if you're on a body, a body composition client and you're fives across the line and you're still dealing with uh, excessive adipose tissue in dangerous places, it's not the weight room. It's not the exercise salon. It's probably the kitchen. It's probably your food prep. It's probably your meal planning. It's probably something else. You know, it's your, your, you need, you need more walking, you need more sleeping. Okay. Hope that helps. And Brandon, pretty simple answer for me workout generator, uh, plus the massive amount of testing and thinking I think you need to do. Thank you, man. All right, we got a guy named Rupert here, and that's great because a good friend of mine was uh, Mr. Rupert, and uh, he died a while ago, and he's a good, a good man. Now, that's a lot of reading, and I'm going to read it straight up, folks, and try not to answer anything. It's a fairly long question, and, and the question basically is, how do you keep things interesting? 
Uh, it seems to be the case, obviously, that personal preferences can vary greatly between people without going too deep into the question of nurture versus nature. Certain tendencies of personality seem to be pretty much hard-coded and beyond an individual's control, even though society at large might attach certain value judgments to them. For example, we know that there is a genetic chronotype that predisposes someone to be an early bird or a night owl. See, I think that's true, but I think it's over. you can overcome it. But I, I said I wouldn't talk. Thus, for about half the population, sleeping in has little to do with laziness, unless you're in the military or with an organization that, that or, or like our state meet, you know, first events at eight o'clock. If you're still sleeping in because you're a whatever, you aren't going to be able to win because you're not there. Again, I was not going to say anything. Similarly, some people are predisposed to crave variety and novelty, while others thrive under conditions of consistency and stability. According to psychometric research employed the big five model of personality. The point I'm trying to make with this long winded intro is that even though program jumping and, and F around itis carry negative connotations for some of us, accepting this personal tendency might actually be the best way to satisfy the rule that in training consistency is king. It's the only thing that matters. Uh, we call it my gym three by 52 or five by 52. If you work out five days a week, 52 weeks a year, you get you know, nine, eight or nine hours of sleep like I do, 366, 365 days a year. Uh, you drink water, you eat your protein, you eat your veggies, good things are going to happen. I, I think that's true. The question I would like to ask you then is how the excited squirrel types among us can best deal with this. A reoccurring theme here we work seems to be that six weeks is, realistically, the maximum length that most, pe most people can stay on the same program. Right. And I would say three workouts is the longest anyone can say before they tweak it. I am always amazed how people tweak really good programs to and turn them into more garbage. Beyond that, what do you think would be the minimum effective dosage, so to speak, that a program has to be run for it to have meaning effect, meaningful effects, sorry, and would be so kind to provide us with some guidelines for an effective compromise between consistency and variety as we plan our training cycles. Yeah, consistency um, is by far the most important thing you can do for all your goals. Um, there's no question about that. But the mistake most people make is they don't automate their systems. Um, so I think the mistake most people make is that they're still using free will. They're still using whatever you want to call that uh, personal drive to get things done. You know, my finances are really good. I Every single bill is an automated pay. I don't. I don't have a single bill I pay. They're all, I've automated every bill. So I'm never late on my bills. In fact, I don't even, I don't think it's possible. So I have about as good a credit as you can hit. I pulled mine up on American Express the other day and my credit score is through the roof. Now, obviously, I mean, I started my credit career when I was like 18 with my first credit card. Uh, was it 30% of your credit score is the your history you know, the longer you've been had credit, the better. 35% of your credit score is uh, how you handle credit cards. And I'm never late on them because uh, they're automatically paid. And also I, I go in, I go into my American Express each and every week and pay it off in full just, just to do it, just to stay ahead of the game, so to speak. So I automate all my finances, uh, I my my savings is automated. Uh, my investments are automated. I don't think about very much. Uh, I have an emergency fund. I have another fund. Um, I'll walk around the house about once a year and say, "Okay, I need to fix this this year," and I start automating how much you know the fix. Uh, and if you're around me, if you hang with me, it, it the stuff I'm telling you will freak you out a little bit. Okay. Finances and physical are generally the same thing. Most people, what they do, they don't do is automate their training. Let me tell you how I automate my training. Every day at 930, people show up at my house to train with me. I don't think about it. Right now, um, 
my car is in the garage. But even then, there's plenty of room. I can train in my garage right now. If it was the snowiest day of the year or the hottest day of the year, uh, my gym is always ready. I think one of the things people miss is the opportunity for inexpensive home workouts. If you had a glute loop and an ab wheel and some calisthenics, you could train at home. I mean, ab wheels, they, they sell them over here at a place called T something Max, TJ Max. And uh, they're like 10 bucks in January because everyone's buying them. Uh, a glute loop, you can probably, I don't know how much they are. I use Brett Contreras's and I get the six pack. I, I don't know, they're very inexpensive. But with just those two inexpensive things, you know, hip thrust, clamshell, uh, you can goblet squat, you know, use Shakespeare or use the dictionary or whatever, or use pots and pans, whatever. And then ab wheel and then push ups and some V ups and some Superman and some, you know, you know, cobras and some, you know, uh, scorpions. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have a pretty good home workout, um, and you know, like like one of the I just read a very nice little article. The person said, you know, whenever I f don't feel like working out, uh, I tell myself I'm not going to the gym today, and they have this little deal that when they skip a workout, they do ten push-ups. And I thought to myself. There is a genius in that idea. So mentally, you didn't skip a workout. You just had one of those days. I figure about one out of five workouts are one of those days. One out of five workouts that I have, pretty good. I had a terrible workout today. I still worked out. You know, wherever the other 66, 67-year-old was doing whatever 66 and 67-year-olds do, I don't, I don't really know a lot of them. Uh, when I go to my high school reunion, I'll be around them. I'll ask them. But, you know, today I did, uh, I don't know, lots and lots of military presses uh, and lots of hanging bent knee uh, leg raises and uh, a ruck, a couple mile ruck. And it wasn't a very good workout, but follow what I just said. I built in, I built in my life. Uh, Mike Warren Brown showed up at 930. I was really staggering around. It wasn't, it wasn't from bad living or anything. I just had one of those mornings where this came up, that came up, this came up, and that came up. And you know how you try to shuffle and fix things and, you know, do stuff. But I still got out because I have automated my training with my intentional community. At 930, cars start pulling up in front of my house. And I go out, open the garage door, pull the car out, and we start training. The number one thing to get rid of squirreling, and, and I get it because my daughter's convinced that I have that condition, um, is to build in systems so that you don't have to worry about it. So how do you build in a system? One, I mean, th there's some standards. I've already hinted to the most common one. You get a training partner. Training partners are great because, you know, you get that little text message on my way. You get that little text message. I might be a few minutes late. Just, you know, warm up and I'll catch you there. Having someone else, uh, I have the equipment the people who come up to my house have the free will. Um, if you decide that you're going to train five days a week with two home workouts and three gym workouts, um, if you can set that schedule up that you meet somebody or you meet someone before for coffee, automate, automate, automate. Now, I'm not perfect. It's funny because I've built my life. Um, uh, Rupert, I have built my life so that my financial world and my physical world are kind of automated. Uh, Dave Turner, he's my weightlifting coach now. Uh, Dick Knottmeyer is my, is my original one. He's 95. He lives in Arizona. Dave just li lives a few miles away. You know, Dave will say to me sometimes, are you going to lift in that meet? And I'll say, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I have the hotel room. I bought the flight. Uh, I registered. I got my card. And then sometimes I'll look over in the corner and I'll see my singlet the socks I wear on the platform, a towel inside of a bag, a chalk and a, a tape already ready to go five or six months before the event because I'm trying to automate my brain so that I see that. And every time I see my singlet over there, my brain says, you better get, the, you know, you better work on your mobility. You better work on, you know, your hinge. You better work on your finish. Automate, automate, automate. Um, that's why I think why having a dog, uh, a bird dog is so good to have a hunting dog, any dog that likes to go for walks, uh, because they're going to 
they're going to be your walking buddy. They're going to be tugging you out the door. Um, what Jeff Hemingway always tells me about, uh, you know, when you move to New York City, everyone lose te loses 10 pounds because for the first time in their life, they walk more places. Uh, being in a city that you can't have a car, uh, kind of the way San Francisco is built for sure. Uh, certainly New York is that way. Uh, owning a car in San Francisco is an investment. I mean, just to park it, uh, New York's the same. Uh, so you walk, you take the city bike and you take the subway and you, you know, meet up somebody and you take a cab or Uber, but you walk, you do things, you automate things. To me, that's the key is setting yourself up for a situation where things are automatic. When you open my fridge, I keep, uh, I keep all my vegetables in Pyrex glass bowls. So when I open them up, I can always see vegetables first. In the shelves of my um, fridge, I have those those protein drinks that have 30 or 40 grams of protein in them. So if I ever find myself in a situation where oh, I got mm, 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 I need something, and I don't instantly reach for the Fritos, and if you know me, you know I only have my kryptonite is Fritos, man. Okay, that is I'm sorry, that's my kryptonite. But if I open up the fridge, I see a protein shake. If I eat a protein shake and snack on whatever's in there. I just looked up there and there's sliced pineapple and there's, uh, we have a, a, a whole bunch of different vegetables sitting in there um, for a, a, like a tapas meal. If I just start eating that, I'm gonna fill myself up with vegetables and a protein drink. It's just a good cho choice. Automate, automate, automate. Um, I would even automate, you if you have a, if you have a smartphone, you can use your smartphone in a hundred different ways to help you. You know, I always use my I always use my smartphone uh, to uh, alarm. I never my my goal in life is to never use an alarm to wake up in the morning. But I'll use my alarm an hour before a podcast. It'll it'll ring and I'll go. Oh, that's right, I got a podcast. Half an hour before it'll ring to remind me I got a podcast or an appointment or whatever. Because I'm using my phone to free my brain up. My phone's gonna remember the appointment where I, I can write or you know call up my 403B or whatever the thing is and you know be on the be on hold for 20 minutes as they're you know whatever. My phone is taking care of reminding me I gotta bounce and go do this thing. Use your phone, use your friends, use any systems you can to automate things. Um, I, those are the best ways I can tell you. Uh, and I'll also just say this, Rupert, most people aren't going to do that. Most people are just going to, you know, oh, I, I got, wait, so what do you got to do? You got to, you got to add a remind, you got to add a alarm to your phone. That's a lot of work. And then it makes a lot of noise. Yeah. That's what I think. You have the ability to overcome this. It's just really hard for many people. Would help me a lot when I trained uh, in those really huge years of my life is I wanted a division one scholarship. I wanted my education paid for. Um, I had seen some things in my life and I knew the options I had in my life uh, weren't as many as a lot of my listeners. So I threw all my uh, eggs in one basket. So for me, what kept me going was, the, you know, to make it as an athlete. If you have something burning like that in your life, it seems to work better. Now, of course, mine is to dance at Josephine's wedding. Uh, I have uh, a new grandchild on the way and I wanna be around for her. Maybe I shouldn't tell everybody that, but it's okay. You know, to be able to hold, you know, another grandchild, you know, to watch her go through all the various things in life, you know, the, you know, I don't know, like Christmas song, you know, when they're in the fifth grade and they sing that song, uh, uh, the dance, the, you know, all the stuff they do, the, I want to be around for it. That motivates me to keep around my weight, to cut back on things that are bad for me, to look at, you know, to sacrifice things financially and physically. So I'll be around. Uh, if you want more on this, man, join the inner circle. Cause this is what I talk about in depth each and every week to our folks. Interesting. Some people don't like that. 
They'd rather just find five sets of five, folks. There, I just answered every non-important question. Five sets of five, five sets of two, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the real important thing, and this is what you're hinting at, is the why. And I, I appreciate that, my friend. Let's move on. Um, Christoph answers a question, um, asks a question that seems to come up a lot. Uh, and it's going to be about pull-ups, of course. Uh, I have some kind of elbow tendonitis in one arm, and it's slowly getting better since I do variations of the pull that do not irritate my elbow. That's great. I found for myself it is important that I try not to pull too much with my arms during pulling exercises, but rather think of them as hooks, the same way we think about our arms in the Olympic lifts and kettlebells and many of the kettlebell moves. I try to pull with my scap shoulders and my upper arms more than with my hands. That's a, I got to tell you, Christoph, right there, I, I'm hoping uh, our gentle listeners are listening because right there is a nice little point. Um, there, if you can find them, I don't know if they still are around, but there used to be these straps that you could put on your elbows and do rowing and pulling exercises with them. Uh, I never got them to work on the vertical, like the pull up. Uh, it always just, for whatever reason, it just, it just feel like my shoulders start choking me out. But for rows, you put these on your elbows like this and you, your, your hands go over the little hook. And so if you're using a machine or a cable system or even barbell, kettlebell, dumbbell, you hold on and it's just that. It's just, so a row becomes that. Uh, there are machines that do that quite well too. Um, you know, of course, then you'd have to go to a gym that has it. So so let's keep, keep going. Uh, this is good. Also doing pulls with palms facing grip, palms facing grip has really helped me. If you mean the chin up, yeah. The chin up is a very, very good bicep exercise. I, I like it. Uh, it's funny because I think if, if you're testing at a certain level, thumbs go around, uh, in the pull up, then thumbs come here, then you don't need testing anymore in your life. Slide over the chin ups and then alternate those with parallel grip chin ups or parallel grip pull ups, I guess, as I do in my gym. Uh, I, I really like uh, having variation in the hands. And one other one that someone showed me a, a while ago, and I tried it, and it's not bad, is when you do the you know conventional deadlift grip on pull-ups. And you really get a chance to see uh, uh, why you might like one over the other. I, I like that, okay. Do you also think that the issue with the middle-aged pull-up syndrome is due to lack of strength in the back muscles and the arm flexors taking over and getting overly taxed. I know this from bodybuilding tradition, which advises often to imagine pulling with the elbows and keeping the shoulders down and back other than just jerking and ripping on the weight. Yeah, ab yeah, Christoph, that is absolutely correct. Um, you nailed it right there. Um, you know, I'll watch people do these pull-ups uh, where they, they, they start to kick and flail and, Get on one side more than the other, and I'm just thinking, yeah, that we, we've got you've gotten so far away. Vince Garanda used to recommend, and I think this is something I, I I I would hand off to anybody that at the top of any pole or row, you hold for two seconds at the top to ensure that the backs wake up, the back muscles wake up, and it's not just you're not just flying into it, momentuming into it. Uh, just that simple change. Of course, the simple change that made a big difference in my life was I hang for 30 seconds, then I do one pull up. I hang for th 30 seconds, then I do the next one. Uh, not only does that build a tremendous grip, but it also seems to uh, make me have to do that as I come up. Now, if you were to do a 30 second hang, one pull up and then squeeze at the top for two seconds, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That probably be the answer to a lot of questions. Um, I like your insights here. I really like this, what you're saying here. Uh, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, the straps, do it. Maybe some of you can invent something. Uh, you know, and even if you have bands at your home, uh, I have those bands. I get them from Perform Better. They're called Dynamax. And the big thick green and the big thick blue, if you know what I'm talking about, 
if you walk back from a post and you put them on your elbows, now it is going to rip the hair off your arms, which doesn't sound like a big deal until it does and it hurts, okay? That's why I don't put many uh, those little uh, mini bands around. Unless I'm wearing socks, I won't do the uh, mini band walk because it rips all the hair out. And listen, it's okay for me to admit that publicly that getting my hair ripped out bothers me because it does. So you just stick your arms in there and you could just, you know, and, and just hold on to the bands and just do that or even find, and find different positions. Um, last time I overcame maps, which is, has to be about a decade ago. And I just picked it up stupidly. Of course, that's the only way you can pick up middle age pull up syndrome. Uh, I, I did do that. And I got the, from the advice from my friend Parker. And I was able to get a lot of pulling in and there was real value to it. So I love what you're saying here, Christoph. And thank you so much. Okay. Greg asked a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next person up is Greg. He asked a question that, I don't know, there's going to be, a, I, I probably would like to have more answers to this, but here we go. He says this, I'm wondering who you would put on your fitness strength, Mount Rushmore and why. So a couple of names leaped out to me first. I'm having problems with the fourth, okay? Um, but for me, in in my career, number one would be Tommy Kono, the great American Olympic lifter and Mr. Universe, 1965, I think it was, might have been earlier. You know, he had, what, three gold medals in the Olympics and 81 world records or something, just whatever. It just, But his books, and I have all three of them, uh, are just wonders. If you get the back issues out of strength and health uh, on uh, the ABCs of lifting, but that's basically what the book became. But Tommy, the thing I like about Tommy Kono, at least in my experience, he was always right. <laughs> it sounds weird to say that, but he was always right. Whenever I got, got away from s some core principle he would teach, that's when I got banged up and, and broken down. So Tommy Kono is number one. A name a lot of people wouldn't know, but I love, is John Jesse. Now, his book, um, The Wrestling Physical Conditioning Encyclopedia, uh, which I get at uh, Bill Hinburn's site, uh, I recommend it all the time. That That's the most famous of the books, but he also had a really good one on conditioning for football, which I thought was very good. Uh, he also had uh, a book on for sprinters and hurdlers, and then he wrote a ton of articles about every other sport. I think he did a lot of articles for the, the Weeder magazine called All American Athlete. Uh, I have a bunch of them in my stacks uh, behind me. And every so often I'll see an article and I'll go in there. Now, the thing about John, which would be a little different, you know, Tommy Kona would say, oh, you're an Olympic lifter. Okay. Snatch, clean and jerk, high pull, front squat, hang, go. Uh, you know, Wednesday, repeat, you know, John Jesse liked a lot more variations. For those of you who like lunges, he's got a thousand lunge variations in there. And, you know, he, and he liked a little bit more sports specific stuff, but I really like John Jesse's work. The third, of course, in, at least in my world would be, uh, Percy Sarity. And a lot of people thought he was insane. And when you read, you know, John Powell's book. Um, uh, be fit or be damned. I mean, what a great title for a book. Uh, and this, this, this book now it's in reprint and, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's how he lifts weights. And, um, it's funny cause I'm looking at the exercise right now. I'm like, yeah, he, he is the foundation of what I call easy strength. Um, uh, I had read about what he had said or, uh, early in my career. And then when Pavel said the same exact thing, I'm like, let's jump on that. <laughs> let's get, let's get on that and take it serious. But I'm, I, I am a, a huge fan of, of, of his work. So Tommy Kono, Olympic lifting, John Jesse, practically every sport. Percy would be the track and field guy. Now I'm going to tell you one, just because, you know, uh, he's my coach, uh, Dick Notmeyer. Um, but there's all, there's probably, it'd be kind of funny It'd be kind of funny if now we could do it. You'd have those three 
And then all of you could add your own personal mentor on that fourth one, you know, so that when you looked up there, you'd see Tommy, you'd see Percy, you'd see John, and then the person who changed your life, you know, like uh, Mr. Freeman, my ninth grade uh, coach who gave us the Southwood program or you know, Coach uh, Coach DeYoung, Coach Lahati, Coach Mon, you know. Uh, well, depending on the time of day, you would, you know, what, you know, you'd be one of those things where you look like this and be one of them look like that. Um, I, I've always had great respect. If, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll do one more list for you. Uh, and this would be the, my own, uh, Dick's on the, uh, Dick Notmeyer's on the major one, but, uh, I would put Ralph Mon, who, uh, famously called me one afternoon. I'm Ralph Mon from Utah State University, and I'd like to offer you a full ride for track and field. You know, great, 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 great man. Lee James, the silver medalist at uh, the Montreal Olympics, who I based so much of my training and other things on. He was he was my first hero, uh, first hero in weightlifting. Uh, Kenny Avery, Avery, the New York Giants uh, linebacker, later played for the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, if you read Seven Days of Sunday, he's Wednesday. And then, of course, Rocky Blyer, who was the Pittsburgh Steelers running back, who got blown up in Vietnam and then came back against all odds and uh, got four Super Bowl rings. I have uh, on that list, on that list, I've met two of them, uh, Coach Mon and uh, Rocky. And sadly, Lee James died before I ever got a chance to meet him, though I know, I mean, I've, yeah. And then Kenny Avery, I literally just missed. We were at a Cincinnati Bengals game and uh, they had brought some of the former players in and it was like, whew, we just missed each other. It was, it was, I was on the, I was on the, I was on the, the turf on the field and I, I just said his name and said, oh, he just was just, and it was just literally just missed him. So obviously sometimes the universe has their own thoughts. In the comments, why don't you share and tell me yours? Because that, that's a hell of a great, great question. I like it. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Bert asks, how do you handle the relationship dynamics when it comes to physical training? I have trained my sisters and wife before. Brave man. My dad has been my trainer in my youth, and um, my eyes did vary. How did you go about training your relatives? Uh, there's a young man by the name of Charles Dickens wrote a book called The Tale of Two Cities. And the opening line is this, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. When Kelly was younger, she wouldn't listen to a thing I said when she was in high school. She was probably the best captain I've ever had on a sports team in my life. It was like having a full-fledged, all-in adult, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My daughter, Lindsay, whom I love, was maybe the hardest athlete I've ever worked with. One time at practice, I gave her some advice on the throws. Now, I just there's a recent article that called me one of the world's best throws coaches. I blush. And her response to me is, I don't need a soccer mom at practice. Ouch. She later became state champ and then went off to a, a nice career at the next level at the university. She was tough, but I, it's tough. I've worked with I have coached, I have coached people who were uh, intimate with them, whatever that means. Uh, and it can be great. And it can also be horrible. Uh, I wish I had an answer for it. The best thing I can tell you is have a close friend and have them coach them. And when you see them doing something wrong, don't tell, don't tell the relative, tell the coach, fold your arms, look away and let them coach up yeah tough stuff man tough stuff great question i know i don't have a good answer hardest some of the hardest work of my life leonardo asks a question i love working out and being active but i can't stand the atmosphere in most public gyms today i notice a lot of unhealthy competition a lot of girls with obscure outfits and lots of makeup did, did you notice the overwhelming spirit of narcissism in fitness? Leonardo, I've noticed the overwhelming narcissists. They're taking over, man. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular who no filter says anything they want. 
It's me, 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 me. If you correct, I am persecuted. If you correct them, oh, you're pers you're attacking me. And, yeah, um, there's a great term called gaslighting, and I discovered that I was being gaslit by someone for a while. Um, all I can say is this, brother. It's not a very good, not a very good answer. Yeah, I notice it. I see it all the time. Having said that, if there's going to be a field where narcissists are going to bloom, it's going to be, you know, <laughs> this industry, you know, bodybuilding and body composition. Um, you know, it's really hard to be a narcissist in a collision sport because you'll say or do something and on the next play, someone will <laughs> hand you <laughs> your head. Uh, no, I've noticed it too. I don't have an answer to it. Um, it's funny. People always say I'm all, I'm so full of myself, me. And I'm always like, God, if you only had any idea of what goes on inside. Yeah. Um, great question. And maybe this next time you're at a workshop with me, you and I will sit down and we'll uh, sit in a couch and we'll stare off. Uh, we'll both get a bag of pretzels and try to figure out how to answer this. Okay. Thank you. So this is our last question today, and I really like this one. Mark says this, I'm a big fan. Uh, I've been a follower of yours since uh, 04, 05. I have often told stories about your fat loss in four minutes whenever the Tabata protocol is brought up. It's still one of my favorite memories. Uh, Lexi was my dog of blessed memory, and I had done my first time the four-minute Tabata front squat workout, and I went for it. And uh, I don't even remember what the weight was, but it was a good weight. It was a good weight. And I was getting 14 reps in the front squat in 20 seconds with a good weight. Racket, step back, racket, step back, racket. And uh, I, after I finished it, I kind of stumbled down the driveway. We had a hill driveway. And I laid down in front of the fire hydrant. And I think I, I, think I passed out, maybe. I, I, I'm not sure. I certainly wasn't all together there. And all I remember is coming, well, opening my eyes and seeing Lexi with her eyes like this. She was a good dog. She was a good dog and a great training partner. Uh, Sirius Black is in the same mold, uh, my dog now. I was curious how you would recommend bridging easy strength and realistic, realistic reps, especially when someone is looking to elicit a little hypertrophy or needs more volume in lieu of load and make progress. Mark, I write about this in my new book. It's, I haven't finished it yet. I'm sorry, I'm working on it. Um, yeah, it's hard to write a book. It's hard. Uh, <clears throat> especially when you got all this stuff going on. Uh, but really, this is what I recommend. You pick two exercises to do easy straight. So I would recommend for most of you to pick bench press and rack deadlift, okay? If you don't have good spotters, make it like incline press. Uh, inclines are a little bit safer if something bad happens the way it goes that way. <clears throat> so that would be what you do three to five days a week, three sets of three, two sets of five, five sets of two, whatever. Once you finish those two and you're gonna use, you know, this idea of you're always gonna leave reps in the tank, you're never gonna miss a rep. After that, then you step back and you do some hypertrophy work. With the rack deadlift and the bench press, uh, incline or bench press, you know, you're covering a huge number of muscles. Um, so what's missing? Well, you might want to do some, uh, and this is one of the few times I think lat pull downs would, I would, lat pull downs have a value, but you know, if you're, if you can't do sets of 12 to 20 with pull ups, I can't, then you could do like lat pull downs, um, and, my favorite style lat pull down is the one that's got the parallel hands like this. Hold it, you know, pull, hold, pull, hold, pull, hold. Uh, and that you could get your three sets of 12 in. So you've done your incline, you've done your rack deadlift, your, your row or your vertical pull or whatever it is, high rep, great, great place for machines. Um, maybe a curl variation. Uh, I mean, I just like the straight bar curl. Um, you know, three sets of eight, three sets of 10, three sets of 12, whatever, maybe higher. And then pick another exercise or two or three that matches what you need. Um, if, you know, 
for most people I know, I'd love to see them do uh, hyper extensions, you know, the three, you know, three sets of eight, 10, 12, whatever. Um, because a lot of people I work with uh, really do need a little extra stimulation on that area. We used to call it the Christmas tree, but it's the spinal erectors in this whole area back there. I wouldn't mind seeing uh, machine leg curls either, uh, a really underappreciated exercise. So that's what I would do. Two exercises to do, uh, two plus one exercises uh, with easy strength. Let me explain that. The incline or bench, the rack deadlift, and the ab wheel. I think the ab wheel is about all you need. And then a high rep pull, probably a high rep curl. I wouldn't mind a high rep leg curl. I wouldn't mind a hyperextension. And if you want to do skull crushers or tricep work, that's fine. Um, most people I know don't really need direct forearm or direct calf work because, you know, nature is very funny about your calves and forearms. Uh, but um, that's what I'm talking about in the book. And I think it's really a good program. Uh, I certainly haven't run it as long as I should, but I have done that what I, exactly what I just told you, uh, three, three days in one week. And I found it kind of nice. I kind of found it like, okay, I can honestly recommend this. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind being my first uh, guinea pig in this study, I'd love to see how you do with that, okay? Thank you. Well, there you go, okay? Um, if you have questions, remember, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll be here each and every week, and I'll try to answer each and every question. Um, I hope things are good for you. And as I always say at the close of this time with you, until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Hey, thanks so much, okay? Bye-bye.